Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And thank you very much to the Technion and their sponsors for having me here tonight. It is my first visit to Israel, and I am mightily impressed. I will unfortunately be speaking English without the aid of interpretation, but I will speak slowly and show a lot of pictures. <laughs> the pictures will be seen best from this side over here, I would just mention to you there. We will be bringing the lights down in order that you can see the pictures better. The experience of going into space has been a profound one for me. For the students here, there are, I think, lots of reasons to study science, technology, engineering, and math. The opportunity to use what you do in the real world is very important. And if you study hard in these areas, you will have opportunities to apply your knowledge anywhere you want from science to engineering to business. So please do consider uh, your education. Doing things that are worthwhile is sometimes hard, but very worthwhile. I will tell t stories tonight, and I hope that you'll, excuse me, I hope you will enjoy them. Thank you now for bringing the lights down so that we can focus on the pictures. Every astronaut hopes to have his name on a, on a patch. And you can see I do have my name there. So once your name is on a patch, and because this is the Technion, and because it is a technical talk, I want to show you one thing we hide in the patch. There was an astronomer named Carl Sagan who talked about the stars, and he said billions and billions of stars. He was attributed with that saying. So the engineers understand that a billion is 10 to the ninth power. I was on the space shuttle 109, but you'll notice the nine is up a little bit. That was our tribute to Carl Sagan billions and billions of stars. We went into space, the seven of us, and on the space shuttle, we allowed very short people, 153.4 centimeters, to very tall people, 193 centimeters. And it helps if you're going to do a spacewalk, one, two, three, four of us, to also be pretty tall, because you have a long arm span. Just a couple of pictures watching our space shuttle go out to the launch pad. And I would also like to acknowledge tonight, since I flew in the same space shuttle that your astronaut flew in, I would also like to acknowledge your astronaut, Elan Ramon, and say how sorry I am that he is not here tonight speaking to you as well. NASA feels a, a great debt for this loss. We hope someday to be able to repay it. But we press on doing what he would want us to do, and that is to celebrate space, to celebrate life. This is our children drawing the picture of our patch before our flight. Before a flight, you're going to have breakfast. You can have anything you want for breakfast. You can have lobster and steak if you want. <laughs> Why do they give us this choice? What we do is dangerous, but we believe in it. It is important to allow people to do things they believe in. We go out to a van and we go to the launch pad waving and smiling. If all goes well, we launch. We go 160 kilometers per hour after six seconds, straight up. It's a pretty fast ride. The launch is spectacular. I do have a movie to show as well. But first, I want to tell a little bit about the living and working in space. On our way up, we went through the clouds. It was my son's 
sixth birthday, March 1st, 2002. And this was the largest candle that I could light for him. We got into space in eight and a half minutes, and then we very quickly go to work. We take a rocket, and we want to turn it from a rocket into an orbiting laboratory where we can actually work and live in space. So we cleaned it up. We made it ship shape, yes. We put the extra spacesuits away. These are the lockers where we keep our food and our clothes, our tools. And you see, anywhere you see blue, little squares of blue, you can see that is Velcro. Yes, Velcro? That's how things keep from floating away. This is the Hubble Space Telescope as we came to greet it. They closed the door so that we will not contaminate the mirror. We were replacing the European Space Agency solar arrays, and for the first time, we were going to power the space telescope completely off, and we were going to put in a new camera. After grabbing the telescope, we put it in the payload bay, and then we got ready for spacewalks. I've never seen a real alien, this is as close as I've ever gotten. This guy right here looked pretty funny. But what we're really doing is taking our helmets and like a scuba diver who puts some soap on the inside of his mask, we do the same thing with our helmet and get it very clean so that it will not fog up when we're working outside. Here is our 153 centimeter army helicopter pilot and she was flying the Canada arm in order to lift large things and people. John is preparing the camera and then it's time to work outside. Now you can see here is a Canada arm and on the end of the arm is a person. The person has both feet locked in and with the feet locked in, you have both hands free to work. If you've ever been swimming and tried to work on something in your swimming pool, you notice when you push, you float away. Same thing in space. So here we are. And as Professor mentioned, this is when I was tightening up the bolt. And I had to be very careful because it started to go wrong. Now, before we went to the Hubble Space Telescope, we talked to all of the other astronauts who had ever been to Hubble. And they told us how valuable Hubble was, how important it was. Valuable, I would say 20 billion shekels, six, seven billion dollars. Okay, so somewhat valuable and very important. And they told us not to break it. And they said, if you break it, don't come home. <laughs> so we worked very hard not to break it. And I was very lucky because, as Professor Mario Livio will tell us later, the things that it has been able to do are so impressive. And I want to tell him, thank goodness we didn't break it. If you are on the arm, you have both feet restrained and you can use both hands. But I am there with only one hand to hold on, to climb around, and then to hand off one of the gyroscopes in order for the telescope to be repaired. This picture I like because it captures so much in one picture. There I am standing in the payload bay, well, holding on, really. And then I have my sunglasses on because it's very bright in the sun. All sun, no clouds. So we have a sunglasses for working in the sun. The spacesuit protects us because it is 100 degrees Celsius outside when you're in the sun. When you're in the dark, it is minus 100 degrees Celsius. And so we also have to have the protection from the heat and the cold in the same spacesuit. 
And there in my visor is the earth reflected below us. And here is the payload bay of the space shuttle. You can tell from looking at me, I'm sure, that it is easy for me to lift 400 kilograms. No, no trouble. Yeah, I'm a very strong man. In space, it is actually very easy to lift many hundreds of kilograms. And so I am removing the old camera and putting in the new one. This digital camera cost $70 million and weighed 400 kilograms and was only a 16 megapixel camera. But this was over 10 years ago. Advanced camera for surveys. We changed out the power system. We used these very special, very complicated tools in order to do that. We ended up working inside. And every once in a while, we would look out and we would notice that we were actually not just working very hard on the, on the Hubble, but we were actually in space flying over the Earth with some truly beautiful land beneath us. There are some people who can see dirt and say where they are. When Mike and I were finished with our spacewalks, we were very happy because we did not break it. We are being photographed in our underwear. But this underwear is very special. It has tubes of water sewn in it that allow us to be cooled off when we're working hard or warmed up when it's very cold. There are a lot of people who work on the Space Hubble missions. The people at the Flight Control Center, the people who work all of the orbit shifts, one, two, and three, and the ascent and entry. And these people are only the tip of the iceberg. There are so many people who work on these missions. And finally, after five spacewalks, it was time to finish up and get ready to go home. But before we did that, on the last day of spacewalks, John and Rick wanted to say thank you, now to, that, to the people who had worked on the flights. And so, John had a very eloquent thank you to the whole team. And after he was finished, Rick also wanted to say thank you. Now, one thing I want to remind all the parents and all of the teachers is that sometimes our words have a profound effect on our students and on our children. And Rick wanted to dedicate the flight to his high school physics teacher who once told him that all he'd ever be good for is taking up space. And he said this to the whole world. I think he was finally got even with that physics teacher. We left the Hubble with the door open, new solar panels in great shape. One more flight came to fix the Hubble. Just a quick mention of what happens in space. In space, we all grow perhaps an inch or two. And this is the measurement. Unfortunately, it is in inches, but I will show you very quickly that in space, as I told you, the 100 and, what was it, 53 centimeter, she grew three centimeters in space, okay? The tallest she'd ever been. And then, if you grow an inch or two, that's five centimeters. So you actually get taller in space because there's no gravity holding you down and compressing your spine. Your children, if you measure them on the door, perhaps, I measure all my children every three months on the door, they are tallest in the morning when they first wake up, a quarter of an inch taller, because during the night when you're sleeping, your vertebrae relax and you get taller. If you are sleeping in space, you can put your 
sleeping bag wherever you want. Strap it down. Maybe you like your head on a pillow. Well, you use a Velcro strap to hold your head to the pillow. See the Velcro strap. Everything in here is held by clips. And notice this clip. Remember this clip here. And see the blue Velcro. Things will float away if you let go. You may lose them sometimes for several flights before they turn back up, jewelry and small things. Then finally, it's time to go home. And if all goes well, and it did, we land. What I'd like to do uh, in the next moments is to show a short video. But here we are again, and again the short and the very tall. And she didn't like always having to stand next to him, but she was his right-hand man, or woman in this case. And now for the uh, volume, please. Then on walkout, it's kind of like coming downstairs on Christmas morning. It's just an unbelievable thrill as you get out there. Uh, of course, the vehicle's parked in the vertical, so it's not like jumping into your car. It's a little bit of a haul to get yourself into the seat. And some of us are a little bit bigger and have a little bit more trouble. <laughs> You can see Mike uh, getting himself in there uh, while the suit tech helps him. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, main engine start, 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia to broaden our view of the universe through the Hubble Space Telescope. This is what engineers can produce when they want to. There, see it? Right there, there's always something loose. Uh, Who Mike didn't put that away? We're gonna go outside and put in the advanced camera for surveys. This is what uh, Sean Mike was referring to, Mr. From New York. Referring to about he the, talks uh, a lot the new too. capability for the Hubble, and we're really looking forward to the... Let me tell now you, living and working in space. We're looking forward to a day off like you look forward to a two-week vacation. Shaving with and, electric uh, we're shaver. Getting things, uh, we're getting ready for the morning there. There's our personal kit. If it's not tied down or Velcroed, you're probably gonna... Uh, Allow folks enough room to get work out. Get some exercise. Uh, there's Mike getting his workout. Let me tell you, exercise felt great up there. It, uh, was, it was a real necessity. Lunchtime on the mid-deck. Not much extra space, but uh, it's good bags. thing we all got along with each other. Mike did a good job that day, so here's his reward. <laughs> good boy. Uh, good boy. The earth really zings by. Uh, Eight here's kilometers a look straight per down second. the coast of South America going into the Andes. Uh, you can see how fast we're moving, even though we're 350 miles up. Uh, Scooter's taking some uh, Earth observation shots with a little bit of spare time on that day off. We got some wonderful views. You can see, you can really see the curvature of the Earth up there. The uh, Earth is round. fifty miles, and we also got some nice uh, sunrises up there. It happens our life, and then uh, the day after that, it was time to come home. We put on our suits and uh, did our deorbit burn and began to fall back into Earth's atmosphere. Things really started to heat up and uh, started flashing outside. Uh, you're going to see in this next shot that it was just a beautiful night uh, as we're falling. This is an infrared shot. You can see uh, the shuttle, the belly of the shuttle heated up from the entry. Field inside on a beautiful night. 300 feet, uh, Digger puts down the landing gear. You can see that they appear dark and cold from being stowed up in the belly. And then this is the shot we had as we came in for landing that night uh, as the runway pulls up in front of us. Just pull the nose up, try and uh, touch down as gracefully as you can with a 225,000 uh, glider brick. <laughs> you can see uh, the landing gear as we touch down here are going to spin up and heat up, become uh, sort of white hot right after touchdown. Drag chute comes out. It's really amazing to me to think that, uh, you know, an hour earlier we were going five miles.
I believe in human spaceflight is very important for humankind. I also believe that robotic spaceflight is also very important for humankind. The Hubble Space Telescope is a robot working for us in space that humans have been able to help fix and to keep working. I'd like to tell you just one of the things that really impressed me about the new camera that we put in. I will leave the science, of course, uh, to Professor Livio, our scientist, but one of the things I want to mention is this idea of what's out in the universe and, and how amazing it is that there's so much stuff. The Hubble Deep Field was a picture taken, and you can see from the, the slide that it's facing away from the sun, and there's this little spot up by the Big Dipper where there really aren't very many stars, not much of interest there. But the director decided to take a picture of this spot for a long time to see what is really there. And so that picture showed this. And you can see that there are lots and lots of galaxies. The stars have these little diffraction patterns, for example. So that's one star, another star. Everything else, galaxies. So everywhere you look, when you don't see stars, just because you can't see it, there are still galaxies. So if we zoom in a little bit right there, there you can see one star, many galaxies. Big ones, little ones, far away, near. This was the old camera that we were replacing, and this is the size of the new camera that we were putting in. So much bigger and much better. So the same sort of picture, everywhere you look, galaxies, some stars, more galaxies. So in our galaxy, a modest galaxy, 100 billion stars. In our universe, anywhere from 200 billion to a trillion galaxies. More galaxies than stars in a galaxy. If we zoom in here now, you can see that we're going to look at this one here. That one there, and we go in even closer, that's sort of what we look like to them. We live out here somewhere in a small neighborhood of the Sagittarius arm, in a spiral galaxy. Galaxies are doing amazing things. There's something went through this galaxy, and then in the same picture, if we zoom in, something massive went through this galaxy as well. And you can see what looks like galaxies very close together. And so, yes, some galaxies are colliding. And so, if you were to model in a computer a collision of galaxies, you might be able to see that it's really happening. And then these two spiral galaxies, every time it spins, one time, 100 million years, ends up with elliptical galaxy. If you want to see the Hubble Space Telescope, you can see it yourself with your own eyes as it goes by overhead. For example, if you were to look on this day, Monday, September 16th, it's a little bit early in the morning for me, but a number of you might still be awake since you are students. <laughs> you can see these two opportunities for the Hubble. There are others and there are better opportunities, but not right now. Just as you can see the Hubble, you can see the space station. And I would encourage the parents to take your children outside. Now, this might be, again, a little bit early for the kids. But it will cycle to the evening time. Take your children outside and show them that there are human beings in space right now, six of them, on the space station. And that this is a place that perhaps they could work someday. Finally, to go back to why is it important to go into space, one of the things we do in space is we look at the Earth. So a little bit of the Earth now. We let the Hubble Space Telescope look at the stars because it is really good at it. 
People are really good at looking at the earth. It's the highest mountain we have. It takes us an hour and a half, hour and a half, 90 minutes to go around the earth. About 50 minutes of sun, 40 minutes of dark. So every hour and a half, you see a sunrise and a sunset. And they're beautiful. You don't want to miss them. But if you do miss one, it's okay, because there's another one coming right up. So what could cast a shadow on the Earth? A solar eclipse with the moon between the Earth and the sun will actually cast a shadow on the Earth. That's what a solar eclipse looks like from space. If you want to see a comet, that's pretty cool, hale bop. But really, the Earth is what's spectacular. This picture is of a typhoon in the Pacific. And as you know, the winds of the typhoon are very fast and very strong. There's a lot of destruction going on down there. But as we fly over it, it looks very calm and very peaceful. Just as this does, too, when we fly over it, it looks very calm and very peaceful. And I hope it will be someday soon. Very interesting to be here. This place I have seen many times with my own eyes. But this is my first time on your dirt. And I like it. We are very always impressed, the astronauts, we see this. This line here. Desert. Life. We like to see famous things from space, and we can see this with our eyes even, and better with a camera, but it is fun to see things like the pyramids. I have seen the pyramids, someday maybe closer. I have seen Mount Everest with my own eyes right up there. We watch the Earth from space. And anything that takes an hour and a half to go around one time cannot be very big. I think it will take me about an hour, hour and a half to go to the airport tomorrow. It only takes an hour and a half to go around the Earth, so it cannot be big. But you're going eight kilometers per second, so it actually is very large. But we can change it, even though it's big. If you look carefully, look at the size of the island and the amount of water. So just in a short period of time, the island is much bigger. There's much less water. So we are changing the Earth, and we can see it. Perhaps we are changing the Earth in ways we don't know. Perhaps we are contributing to climate change. We need to study and find out just what we're doing. But the Earth itself will also make it changes. And volcanoes we cannot predict, for example. It's beautiful to see the northern lights from space. We also see the evidence of craters. The dinosaurs are not here today, perhaps because of a very large crater. But we are. But we should also think, if the dinosaurs aren't here now, Will we always be here? In the Pacific Ocean, there are lots of small islands, but they're very far apart. This one, for example, every time you see an island, you'll always see a runway on it, some place for people to land an airplane. And as we go across the Pacific Ocean and we see so much water and every once in a while a little bit of land, but people found those islands without having seen them first. I think some of the most powerful pictures are the pictures taken from very far away, on the way to the moon, for example. The Earth really is small. It's a beautiful place. We want to live here. We're designed for it. But as we fly around the moon, we see 
There may be other places to live, the moon, Mars, who knows what else is out there. I believe that we will find not only other planets around other stars, as we have found, but someday we will also find life in other places. Whether it will be alien life that is smart enough to come here, I doubt it. Uh, and I just want to point out about the aliens, because people like to know about the aliens. If NASA could prove that there were aliens, NASA would prove it because NASA's budget would go way up. So the fact that NASA's budget is not going up tells me that we can't actually prove that there are aliens. So for now, we'll just have to think about it. Finally, I'd like to say that it is important to study hard. It is important to aim high. And I'm very much looking forward to learning some science tonight in the next lecture. Thank you very much.